ADHD Rewired, episode 419. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter. You can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups. Learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups. You can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. We are here with our panel of answerers uh, with some new people as well, but let's uh, go around and introduce everyone. We have Will Curb of Hacking Your ADHD. Hey there. Glad to be here. Glad you are here, Will. Good to see you. And we have MJ Siemens, host of ADHD Diversified. Hi, everybody. Hello. And we have Coach Moira Mabin, host of the ADHD Friendly Lifestyle. Hello. Feeling my ADHD today. All right. So uh, we, we feel you. And we have, uh, for the first time ever on a podcast, Lisa Cisla, ADHD Rewired's a new executive assistant for me and our community manager. Lisa, welcome. Thank you. Nice to meet everyone. I'm excited to be here. We are excited to have you. And we have Brendan Mahan, host of ADHD Essentials. What's up, team? <laughs> wow. Wow. I could have kept Love going. It. Wow. <laughs> um. That's my fault. But I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> And we have Coach Kat Hoyer. We are so excited to have Kat joining us here for the Q&A. Kat is going to be one of our coaches in this spring season, taking on two groups. She's also our CASH, our adult study hall facilitator for all things career related. Kat, how's it going? Yeah, good. Going great. I'm excited. My first, my first time being on this panel. So glad to have you. And we have the very, very important... Terry, who is going to be asking the very first question. Terry, what is your question? Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. My question is, I'm looking for ADHD relevant organizing resources. I'm going to be preparing to relocate into a smaller apartment. And frankly, this place is a mess. And so it's a 600 footish now. It's going to be um, about 488 feet. And it's going to happen April 30th is when I need to be out of here. But I have two months to transition. And uh, thanks for any suggestions you have. And also with that said, I have a rescheduled for about the third or fourth time uh, trip out of state to Florida that hits right in the middle of this. And I'm wondering if it makes sense to still have a 10 day trip in the middle of this chaos of trying to organize and not bring in stuff to the new place that I don't love and, and, and want to keep. So I want to try to go through things that I haven't gone through in years. And we have three storage units between uh, as well that I'm dealing with. So your thoughts on how I can manage this to help. Thank you. All right. Well, moving sucks. There is, there is no good getting around that. There is nothing that I have ever experienced that I could say is joyful about moving. It's hard. So a couple good things that I hear is that the scope of moving is only so big because of the space you're currently in and the space you're moving to. Um, what's your budget? Because if you can hire a professional organizer to help you with this, that could be helpful. Um, I was trying to go for $30 an hour. Unfortunately, I checked um, with, uh, what's that called, uh, National Service, and they said it would be over $500 uh, for five hours. Okay. Uh, excuse me, 10 hours. So I'm just not sure about that, but I would have to check with my, my boyfriend's frankly helping me financially. Okay. So I kind of think he'd be having us try to do it ourselves, but I, I don't know. But when you think about what you have to do, what it's the, what's the most overwhelming part for you right now? Uh, gosh, going through the things that I haven't 
looked at in years uh, when I came in here. I never dealt with that originally. So, and I don't want to bring stuff in. I think making those decisions or even knowing what I have so that I can make appropriate choices in that smaller space and not bring in stuff otherwise. You know, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, all right, wait, let's, let's, let's hear what the panel has to say. Moira? I have moved a lot. I was a military kid, so I'm like, I know I'm up in over 20 moves. Wow. Um, one of the things I just did was I Googled a checklist. I'm wondering, do you have a list of the things that you know you need to do or a way to find out what needs to be done? And I guess I'm also wondering how familiar you are with moving as a task. Uh, frankly, it's been wholesale moving. When I've had to move, it has just literally been throwing things in boxes and then hope I get to them. And frankly, it's never happened. Okay. Segwaying a little bit, you asked about going away. Going away, does that, recharge, like, will that recharge you and give you a break from all of this or will it make you more stressed? I, I'm leaning toward recharging, especially because I live in Northern Minnesota and I'm going to Florida. Yeah. So, so I would say hell yes, because <laughs> I even know, like I've done a lot of traveling and one of the things with that is when you move around a lot, it's, it's exhausting. So sometimes even with that, taking a break and like staying somewhere longer. So Uh, When Eric asked you about paying for things, I'm wondering about thinking about the things that are the most difficult for you or the ones that you can hand off, like hiring someone to clean your place when you're done. So you don't have to do that. And maybe cleaning where I've, because I know people are supposed to leave places clean. I have never moved into somewhere that is actually clean, but chunking it and breaking it down and allowing yourself to do it in pieces and taking breaks is something that's really helped for me doing things like room by room or thing by thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's, is it the figuring out what you want to take and what you don't want to take? Like, tell us a bit more about that. Sure. Um, I don't even know necessarily what I have. Um, I mean, I, I know what kind of the ideas off the top of my head of what I want to have in the new place. I'm already giving that some thoughts, but I feel the need to go through what I have now and actually focus and take the time. And that's where if it's things that you're keeping and if you're like buying containers, buy clear, because if I can't see it, it doesn't exist. An inventory as you go, what you have, like what's in this box and maybe number them. If you're worried about getting stuck in the going through stuff, maybe you could categorize initially This is something that's definitely going. This is something that's definitely not going. And this is something that needs more time and attention for me to figure out. And then as you get closer to the move, you'll know if you have that time pre-move to go through those things or not. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that. I want to add to that. So one of the, uh, when when I moved a couple of years ago, I literally labeled every item that was in, in each box and then had a master form of like, of which box number had which items. So I spent a lot of time doing this and then I forgot one critical step and that was to start marking them off when I was unpacking. So, uh, (laughs) so if you're going to do that, uh, make sure you mark them off. Otherwise all that work is is almost like for no point. Um, And uniform boxes uh, and and pack not by item, but by room. Cause then it's like you're putting it in that space and then you bring the box to that space. Makes sense. And load, load in the back. If you're loading, load in the back, the things you need last, right? Have the things that you need first and handy. And connected to that, this might require more. This is like a, your executive function may vary with this particular strategy. It might be worth it to kind of organize boxes. I agree, go by room, but maybe you could do like, this box is stuff that I need. And this box, if I never open it again, it won't matter, right? that kind of does two things. One, you don't, if you don't open that box, you don't feel bad. You didn't lose anything important. And two, if it's like a year after you moved and you still haven't opened that box, donate it, chuck it, like just get it out of there. Mm -hmm. Um, So that might be a, a, maybe a way to sort things as you're packing them. The other thing I want to say, and somebody's knocking on the door. Um, Maybe they have answers. (laughs) Yeah. Can you get them on the phone? We can talk to them and see if they can help. (laughs) Um, When you pack for your trip, try Uh to set yourself up so you don't have to unpack from your trip. Like, see if you can do stuff that just can stay packed for when you, and then you move and then it's in your new house. And if that makes sense. And I don't know exactly how the timing works, but that might be a thing you can do. So try that. All right. That's helpful. Thank you very much. I better go see what's going on here. (laughs) Yvette, good luck with your move. 
All right, uh, Lisa, who do we have next? The question about emotions. She said emotions are really big and dysregulated with ADHD, as we know. Do you have any advice on dealing with surprise disappointments that come up? Hmm. Surprise disappointments. Um, well, I think anytime you get flooded by emotion before you interact with anyone, try to get yourself regulated. You know, I, I have a, a, an expression that I like, and that's the idea that when sort of hot on certain emotions, that I'm not safe for human consumption, right? And so it's like, no matter what I'm feeling like seems like a good idea, I'm discharging this particular emotion. It's not going to be a good idea. So it's do whatever you need to do to, to um, sort of discharge that emotion. Oh, a couple months ago, I listened to a book on, uh, it's called Burnout. And one of the, uh, the key takeaways from this book is that when we look at stress management, most people are trying to focus on stress management by addressing the stressor, like the actual thing that's causing the stress. But what research is showing is that the way we deal with stress often has nothing to do with the stressor, but how we're actually dealing with the physical manifestations of stress. And so it's doing exercise, it's meditating, all those self-care things, it's human touch, it's sex, it's the things that we know are actually really good for our body. Those are the things we have to call completing the stress cycle. And uh, in terms of evolution, you know, so much of our stress cycle was triggered because we were going to be eaten by a bear. So we needed to have that, uh, that stress response in order to either, you know, fight, fight or freeze. So uh, by focusing the emotional response and getting a physical outlet for that uh, is going to be probably one of the most effective ways to go uh, with that. Anything to add? Moira, you were, I don't, I don't know if you were like, I got excited. We're getting because, excited. Yeah, because a lot of times on my podcast, when I'm talking, I just, I've just started doing some ones on being a, a mom and having ADHD. Um, I'm saying more stuff like how do we manage ourselves and that just relates to it as opposed to like, how do I get my kid to go to bed on time? It's like, well, am I getting enough sleep first, right? Am I doing those things? So, so it just got me excited because I'm a geek about all this stuff. I, I just saw in the, uh, in the chat uh, that Hannah said, I, I used uh, completing the stress cycle this morning to not ruin my entire day. It worked. That's awesome. It's like it become a catchphrase. I'm sorry, I'm not available right now. I'm just completing my stress leave cycle. A message. I'm completing my stress cycle. <laughs> Going with a stress or approach instead of a stress stress e approach. One of the things that's helped me navigate surprise disappointments is uh, I have a really good imagination. So I imagine less. Like I have fewer expectations about what is going to happen when plans are made. And that helps me be disappointed less because if the thing didn't happen, I haven't already lived it. Like I used to live the whole thing. Like we're, I'm going to go skiing with my kids. And then I would live that entire experience. I'm imagining going down the ski slopes and talking to them on the chairlift and all this stuff, hot cocoa, whatever. And so if for some reason we don't go skiing, I'm like, oh, right. Like it's like a sock in the gut. But now that I don't do that as much, I'm just like, cool, we're going skiing. Maybe like everything is sort of a maybe for me. Things go more smoothly. Awesome. MJ. My, my first thought that came to came to mind when I read this was expectation management of being dysregulated and those surprise disappointments. I've found for me that the higher or the more expectations I have, the more I have set myself up for being disappointed. It's been one hell of a practice to try not to expect anything outside of myself, but it's also been hard not to expect anything extra from myself too. So for me, trying to manage my inner expectations of me and expectations of other people and really trying to be open to that, like I'm going to be disappointed at some point or another, regardless of the amount of expectations I have or the weight of the expectation that I have. And really sitting with the, those emotions when they come up and asking myself, like, where is my, that story coming from that I am feeling disappointed in this moment? I hope that's helpful. Hormones, like that's another one that can make them, you know, I, when I did all this tracking, my self-concept is worse the week before and the week of my cycle. Sometimes, you know, that's just part of how we are. And so being aware of how we're feeling in those periods and trying to create a reality for ourselves where we're not necessarily in situations where we might experience a heightened emotion. 
And I think too, if using a cognitive reframe, um, you know, I think one of the the things that I find to be super helpful is being extremely generous with your presumptions of someone's intentions, right? Like it's so often we something will happen and we jump to like, oh, this person, you know, they don't care or didn't that person realize or whatever the story. And so many of these strong emotions are triggered by stories we are telling ourselves. So if it's already a story, if that story is not serving us, let's write a different story, right? Kat, any thoughts on this one? A ton, yes. Um, <laughs> but it's a lot of what you guys have already said, but maybe a different way. Um, I like to say when you've got the big emotions, any emotions, the best way through them is to sit with them, like what with what MJ was saying. So I like to work with people to do a, a take two where we sit with that. We just quietly sit with it, see where we're feeling it in our body and allow it because it's really the resistance of whatever it is we're feeling that hurts more than anything. So when you allow it, it starts to um, kind of dissipate a little bit. We're able to look at it differently. And then sort of what you just said, what I like to say is if I'm going to make up shit in my head, I'm going to make up shit that makes me feel good because most of the time that's what we're doing. So if I'm going to, you know, make stories up, whatever it is, if I don't know the truth. So of course I've got an acronym for this. Cause Kat has an acronym um, for everything. For everything. So when you're thinking about something, you can ask yourself, use the acronym think I did not make this one up and I don't know who it is. Otherwise I would give them credit for it, but is it true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, or kind? And most of the time we can stop at true because we don't know if it's true. And that's when we can go, all right, then let me make up a new story that's going to serve me. So before we answer uh, any more questions, I think we should take a pause to think, and we will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from ADHD Rewired's coaching and accountability groups. We are nearing the end of our 27th season, which means time is running out to register for our spring season of coaching and accountability groups. If you want to discover ADHD-friendly ways to plan your days and weeks, become more aware of what you're really spending your time doing, create actionable to-do lists that reflect your intentions, and do all of this and more with other adults with ADHD just like you, then we'd love for you to join us. I decided to join this group because I was stuck. Well, I decided to join because I was trying to do this uh, by myself and it just wasn't working. I decided to join this group because I had been feeling completely stuck in my life. I couldn't seem to get started and didn't know where I wanted to go or how to get there. I decided to join the group because I became aware of how much ADHD has impacted the use of my time. I have never had an experience like this that I've been dragged kicking and screaming into by myself that has been so impactful and so important for my growth. Taking this course provided me with ADHD-friendly skills and tools that would have taken me years to learn on my own. And I realized also that I was doing more planning, maybe more thinking about it than doing, and it was very unstructured and almost random. Yeah, like learning to plan. Planning was probably my biggest thing and the importance of daily planning and um, thinking that through, whether it's the night before or the day or the morning of, and then also yearly planning and and, uh, how much that's going to affect me in the future. Another insight I had was I discovered I need to do my daily planning the night before instead of waiting till the morning of because when I wait, I have a much harder time making decisions and getting started. I think that I've, I've made strides that would have taken me 10 years, if not more, if I weren't in this group. But I've learned from this is that I can make a simple commitment of time of 15 minutes and maybe ideally a time block of an hour and I can get a lot of stuff done. And I just want to thank everybody for being here because it's so powerful to just listen and be with everybody else. I think the, the best part for me was there's a group of people who are all coming from like different backgrounds, but have like a shared experience and having ADHD. So thank you. Go to coachingrewired.com to stay up to date on section availability for this spring. Our last two registration events for our spring coaching season are coming up next week. One on Wednesday, March 16th at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. And the next on Thursday, March 17th at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern. That's Wednesday, March 16th at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 Eastern. And Thursday, March 17th at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern. 
And if you are in Australia or that surrounding region of the world, that last registration event that I just mentioned is on Thursday, March 17th at 10 a.m. Australian Eastern Time. That is for your time zone. All that is on the website. As of this recording, Section 1's 6 a.m. Pacific, 9 a.m. Eastern with Coach Moyer Maben of the ADHD Friendly Lifestyle Podcast is now full and we are starting a wait list. Then in my section, which is Section 3 at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, we have just three spots left in my section. Section 2 and 4 with Coach Kat Hoyer have nine spots left in each section. So go to coachingrewired.com for all the session times and details. And if you are in and around Australia or you can only do a group in the evening, go check out Section 4. We made this one for you. We are still accepting applications for our next two registration events for our 28th season of coaching. All pre-registration materials are due 24 hours ahead of your registration event. To learn more, get your name added to our interest list at coachingrewired.com. And after you've confirmed your email, all of the dates and the pre-registration details that you need to send to us will be sent to your inbox. And if you've signed up, but you're still waiting for your email, don't forget to check your spam folder. Now, if there's one promise I can make, it's that at the end of these 10 weeks, you will still have ADHD, but that doesn't mean the support stops there. Our members have continued their personal journey with our alumni membership community because maintenance is hard. Whether it's revisiting our to-do lists, remembering our successes, or time blocking our calendar, we don't have to do any of that alone. Find out more and get signed up for our 28th season of coaching and accountability groups built for adults with ADHD by adults with ADHD by going to coachingrewired.com. Come grow with us. We know that starting is the hardest part, so get started by going to coachingrewired.com and add your name to that interest list. That's coachingrewired.com. We'll see you soon. And we're back. All right. <laughs> Let's uh, take our next question. We have uh, Gerald. And let me know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly or not. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> you, you wouldn't be the first to struggle with the pronunciation. So what, what is it? What is the pronunciation? <laughs> yeah, actually, you got it spot on. Oh, I did. Okay. All right. Yeah. You're, you're not going to believe uh, how far even my own family members can get <laughs> me wrong. <laughs> does does, does yeah, the ADHD how, run in your is, family too? I can't say about my extended family, but it's no doubt to my dad does because um, when I look at him, it's everything that I struggle with, he definitely does, plus a few others. So it's like I, he picks even more boxes than I do. All right. So what is your question? So I, I was diagnosed a year and a half ago. It was a bit of a shock at first because it, like I lived, what, 36 years of my life and, and I thought it was all me. And... It was good to know that it's not, thanks to my therapist and uh, your channel as well as, as others. Uh, my question is, my dad, uh, okay, he, he loses his temper a lot and it can be very, very difficult to talk to him. And a lot of that is actually, <laughs> it's got to do with the impulsiveness of, the, of ADHD. You said this was your, so, your dad, you said? That's right. Yeah. So... If I didn't know better, I would have felt that some of the things he did would be could be borderline abusive to my to my sister and my mom and also myself. So I do suffer from anxiety, and now I realize a lot of it is tied to things that he says. Which I don't blame him now because it's, a lot of it is involuntary. But if uh, this goes on, it doesn't bode well for the family as a whole. It places a lot of stress on everyone and I'm not sure how to do it because at, at this point the options can be as bad as if, if I have to leaving home completely and never coming back. Uh, Does your dad live with you? I'm currently out of a job so I'm living at home so I, I can't. You're staying with him? Yeah I'm staying with him. At the moment I don't have a choice okay. but my intent is where when I get, when I'm back into work, I will be leaving the house. 
But the thing is, I feel that it's actually a serious enough matter that I, if, if, I, if I, I find it very awkward to say that at, at this age, the thought of uh, running away from home actually makes rational sense. You know, it's family is that one community that we can't really choose. But know, what we yeah. can choose is how we interact with them, right? Just because somebody is family doesn't ever give them the right to walk all over us, right? And so, you know, exploring things like improving how you communicate what your boundaries are and then following through on those kinds of things. It sounds like you uh, were being very sort of generous with your, with your um, assumptions of your father's intent, which is a, a very kind starting place. And I think it's a great place to, to start. But I think being able to communicate and not in the moment of an altercation, but like when things are actually good and calm to start bringing these kinds of things up and share, you know, when you do this, that makes me feel like that. If this continues, what I'm wanting to do is leave, but I don't want to have to leave because we can't get along. So it's really sharing what his action is, how it makes you feel and what what you're actually asking for in response. You know, there's a lot of good books on, on this kind of topic. Um, there's a, uh, a book that I, um, I listened to uh, a year or two ago, Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents, which may be a really helpful read for you, at the very least to kind of validate that experience. Um, you know, and you don't need to be a, like a... If you're, if you're, for anyone, for anyone who's not treating you kindly and with respect, you don't need to stay there and take it. Like walk away, you know, you can start by saying, you know, I can talk to you, but not if you're going to treat me this way. And then you, you walk away if you need to. Other thoughts from the panel? Yeah. Just to add on with Eric, it's like, yeah, setting boundaries is incredibly important. And then being like, yeah, this is where I'm going. I'm willing to go to and making sure you follow through. It's yeah. like, Hey, if you're going to treat me like this, I'm going to, you know, walk away from the situation kind of stuff. And it's very hard to do, but it is essential in that kind of relationship. Um, and as Eric was saying, that it's very generous for your assumption of how your father is acting. It's, it's not his fault, but it also is he's still responsible for his actions. Uh, just keep that in mind that it's you don't want to just completely write off what he does because of ADHD, because I have ADHD and I have children and I need to make sure that for myself, that I don't let a lot of those emotions and stuff that sometimes come out be things that affect my kids. So it's, I have those impulses, but I can be like, Hey, I'm still a, a person that can be a person. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I, I, sometimes I can't be a person and I need to walk away and it's really hard in this situation because it's not you, it's someone else and getting someone else to change is a almost impossible situation sometimes. Yeah. Moira? Um, I was just going to speak to the fact that at, at the beginning and in your note, you wrote about the idea of helping your family understand ADHD more as a piece of this. You know, people's receptiveness to hearing this varies greatly. And the one thing that we can do is talk about our own experience and maybe not so much because I don't know the situation, whether or not, you know, that there's recognition that you have ADHD or um, about how your brain works and what works well for you. Because sometimes, especially when people, well, I don't, not necessarily when people are older, but what I guess what I found in some of my relationships with closer older people is they've come to a place in their own minds of their sense of self and whether or not there's a willingness to look at that and a willingness to want to change. MJ and Brendan. Um, another book that might be helpful is nonviolent communication. Mm -hmm. That one's helped me out a lot too. in just sort of communicating what my needs were, or even just hearing what the other person has to say. And without, I don't have a better word for it, but justifying their actions or their words because yes, it's there, there's a reaction there on somebody else's part potentially, but that doesn't, right. It doesn't give them the right to treat us like a lawn chair. And like, we don't have to fold every time something happens, right. If, and when you have the opportunity to move out and be independent again, and if this kind of communication continues to come up, 
something that might be helpful to ask without being confrontational is like if they're being demanding or commanding or borderline abusive, as you, as you said, is asking, okay, like we're both adults now, I am independent again. I'm curious as to what you believe the dynamic is between us and what you expect of me from this relationship. We can look at ourselves with our own ADHD and, and know what our tendencies are and reflect on those as to how we react. That's the best that we can do. You know, you, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. We can, we can give everybody all the information in the world about stuff, but until they're open to listening to and applying and understanding what that information means and how it might apply to them, that there is only so much that we can do. So yeah, it, it's, it's, it, it's hard. I feel for you. Um, good luck, man. It's, it's tough. Thanks, MG. And I know that there's so many people in, in, in the ADHD community who have challenging relationships with their parents. It is not an uncommon, uh, an uncommon struggle. Um, so I want to throw out the work of Prochaska and Di Clemente on the change, the cycle of change, which is it's like mental health stuff. But this frame might be helpful for you to kind of recognize where dad is and who's responsible for helping dad move through this cycle. And it's not you. It's dad. So we start with pre-contemplation, which is I have no intention of changing this behavior and I probably don't even recognize that it's a problem. Then there's contemplation, which is now I'm aware of the problem, but I still have no commitment to do anything about it, right? I'm still not going to do anything. Preparation is when that like intent to act is starting to happen. We're starting to see the problem, starting to see that I need to do something about it. And then we get to action where we're actively trying to change and modify our behavior. Then there's maintenance, right? Now I have to maintain this new behavior and potentially that gets followed up by a relapse where we fall back into old habits. <laughs> and now we're back to pre-contemplation. And so just know that that cycle exists. And I don't know where your dad is on it. I imagine it's in the pre-contemplation contemplation range. But this isn't fast. It isn't a thing that happens overnight. It takes work and it takes time and it takes some level of self-awareness. Yeah, you, right. I, so I just wanted to share that in case it's useful. Um, and for those of you, anyone who's looking to make a change or is trying to help their kids change or their spouse change or something, this applies to everything. And Brendan, you kind of mentioned the, uh, the the relapse part of this as possible. When we look at behavioral change. Yeah, that's familiar. Yeah, no, I mean, here's the thing. I would say not possible. I would say expect it. Because then when you, ex when you can expect it, then you can uh, set up triggers and cues for yourself to kind of come back to that change. Right. So instead of being frustrated that, um, you know, I'm, I'm back here again, it's like, okay, this is actually normal human behavior, right? Right. And so it, it's, we can sort of skip the step where we're beating ourselves up and go, okay, we're human. Here we go. Let's, let's get back to this. All right, let's go, uh, Kat, and let's take a quick break. I'm actually come at this with a little bit different perspective in that probably even a little more Al-Anon based, if you're familiar with that. So that's if you have anyone in your family that has any type of addiction, um, that's what Al-Anon is for. Um, so it may not be specifically around this, but one of the things to remember is that there, I think Brendan kind of touched on this, but, but the other person's actions really have nothing to do with you. So remembering, you know, you didn't cause it, you can't change it. The other thing is to, for me, that's one of the things that's really helped is to love from a distance. Al-Anon specifically teaches you how to detach with love. So you can still love yeah. them, but um, love them a bit from a distance. And for me, um, even those in my family that may not have any type of addiction, it can help me enjoy my time with them and know that I don't have to emotionally engage. That doesn't happen overnight. That takes some work to do that. But I would also say that one of the best things you can do is, is to find community in this where you can find some support around it because this is something that's really hard to deal with on your own. So if you are able to find anyone else and just kind of have some, some support, because this is tough. All right. We hope that that was helpful for you and for everyone else. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and then we will be back with more of your questions. So we will be right back. 
If you're listening to this episode on the day it came out, the ADHD Rewired family is going live every second Tuesday of the month at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. I am joined by my fellow podcasters, Brendan Mahan with ADHD Essentials, Will Kerb with Hacking Your ADHD, MJ Siemens with ADHD Diversified, and Coach Moira Mabin with the ADHD-Friendly Lifestyle. Also joining us will be Coach Kat Hoyer and the ADHD Rewired Executive Assistant and Community Manager, Lisa Cisa. To join us live, head on over to ADHDrewire.com slash events to register. Join us on Zoom. Then head on over to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast network to discover more from the ADHD Rewired podcast family. There's a little something for everyone. And if you find value in this show and learn something new about ADHD every week, I would like to invite you to leave a rating and a review if your podcast app allows. Share your favorite episodes and don't forget to hit subscribe or follow to stay up to date with the most recent episodes that come out every week. Your shares and your reviews help get this show on more speakers and more headphones. And we want all of our friends for ADHD who listen to the show to know that you are not alone. Subscribe to the show and discover more from ADHD Rewired by going to ADHDrewired.com. That's ADHDrewired.com. Thanks so much. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our Patreon community. If you enjoy and find value in this podcast, please consider becoming a patron at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Perks start at just $5 a month and support can start at any amount that works for you. At $5 a month, you'll gain access to a private podcast feed where you can enjoy ad-free episodes of the show. And if you support us on Patreon for $25 a month, you'll be able to join me for our patron-only monthly coaching call. Our next patron-only coaching call is on Tuesday, March 22nd at 3 p.m. Central. That's Tuesday, March 22nd at 3 p.m. Central, which is 1 Pacific for Easter. Whether you want ad-free episodes, you want to join our monthly coaching calls, or want to support this podcast because you find value in this show and can relate to the other stories you hear every week, your support is very much appreciated. Perk started this $5 a month, and support can start at any amount. Again, thank you so much to all of our patrons, old and new. And if you want to consider getting some extra perks, consider becoming a patron by going to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And thanks, everyone. And we're back. Thank you, Lisa. All right. So we're back. So let's go to our next question. Who do we got? All right. We got Valerie. Hi, Valerie. Hi. Uh, my name is Valeria. Oh, Valeria. Okay. A- Thank you. Sorry. It's okay. No worries. It's nobody ever gets it right. So you're good. You're having like a hard day with names today. So uh, it's, it's <laughs> just any day that ends in Y for me. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm a critical care nurse practitioner. I do shift work. I work 14 hour shifts about three to four days a week. I rotate between day shifts and night shifts every other month. So I'll do a month of days, a month of nights. And I also drive about an hour each way to work. So some days, like when I'm working, it's I work and then I come home, go to sleep and there's, I barely even like eat. Um, I know how important sleep is with ADHD, but I'm having trouble having any sleep hygiene at all with my schedule. So I was wondering if you all had any tips. Ooh. Well, first of all, your situation just sounds non ADHD friendly, let alone brain health friendly. <laughs> There's a really uh, growing body of research talking about shift work and how actually bad it is for our health. So it's like, I know you're looking for like, what are the strategies to make this easier? Sometimes the hard thing to do is to actually reframe the question and ask, is this what I need to be doing? Is there another way that I could be uh, doing this? Brendan? This is a solid, is it the fish or is it the water question? Mm. And it's the water. It, like Eric <laughs> is saying, it is not the fish, right? So Eric is going, wonder if you want to be in this water, which is the easier choice compared to where I was going, which was get involved in your union and change the water, right? Like that's an option too, is you can 
try to change it. I don't understand. I'm sure there's a reason that is sort of maybe pretending to be valid. I don't understand why nurses have such insane hours. It doesn't, I, I don't get it. I understand the continuity of care thing, but there's gotta be a way to crack that nut that doesn't involve nurses working forever. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's a great answer to this one. Sorry. Well, yes. So given that there is not a good answer, <laughs> we can go with a, what can you do answer before switching jobs and getting the system changed is, uh, as you mentioned, sleep hygiene is very important. And the specific things you do with sleep hygiene, with making your room a very good place to sleep so that when you do have an opportunity to sleep, you can get right to it. So doing things like making sure it's a pitch black room, having it at a good temperature, depending what you find is good sleeping conditions for you, then making sure that you aren't on caffeine when you go to sleep. Uh, for some people with ADHD, they report <laughs> it can help them sleep, but a lot of research shows that it just doesn't have the same quality of sleep. I have not actually seen research specific to caffeine and sleep and ADHD. So I can't say too much to that because I know with shift work, you're going to clearly be using caffeine. And then along with that, yeah, just mentioned the pitch black room, but try to get any of the lights that are in your room to not be on. There's lots Including of LED lights. Like, yeah. All the LEDs. Like I have, um, if you get like electric cape, you can put that over a lot of the, like the, there's a little light over on my smoke alarm in my room you can just cover up the light. It's, I can still know that it's active. I don't have to actually see the light. Not having one of those bright LED alarm clocks that's lighting up the room. They actually sell so. specific. It's like a, a dark film that's designed to go over like a cable box or your alarm clock. So you can still see it, but it makes it way darker. Yeah. yeah you can get them on Amazon. They're, it's pretty cheap. But in general for the entire thing is to try and make it so that even though the shift is work is changing when you would go to bed, that you still have the same routine for going to bed, regardless if it's coming in the morning or coming in the evening and, you know, cutting off screens before going to bed, because a big part of screens is not the actual looking at the screen. It's the amping up of our emotions when we're watching an exciting TV show or playing a video game or reading just terrible news. Doom scrolling is not helpful for going to bed. Yeah, I mean, looking at the science of sleep, you know, the ways you can sort of recalibrate your, your sleep cycle. I know that there are things like low dose melatonin regimens, uh, but I would definitely talk to a doctor about doing that, you know, making sure you're getting morning sunlight. Um, the, the tricky thing is, is the recalibration and the recalibration so often. Right. It would almost be better to have a recalibration once a quarter versus as frequently as you're doing it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I also live in Connecticut, so it's dark as soon as I wake up and often when I go to sleep too. Um, the one thing I was going to add is one of the things that happens a lot of people with not getting themselves to bed is often that's when we do the things that we really want to do that we don't let ourselves do during the day when there's other people around. So if you find that you're coming home from work and... You're like, well, I'll just do this and I'll just do that. If there's a way to allow yourself to do those things during the day so that you don't feel that need, it might make it easier to transition into sleep. But yeah, I feel you. I was, I'm with these guys. Um, I, I won't even take an overnight flight if I can avoid it because it just messes yeah, me up so bad. Yeah. And thank you for being a nurse. There is, there's such a shortage right now of nurses. So thank you for doing this in the least probably ideal uh, environment that you can imagine. Uh, so we appreciate it. I know your community appreciates it. So hopefully this is the forever scenario. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully we can get some staff and COVID will be over soon. Uh, <laughs> let's hope. Yes. All right. Well, good, good luck. All right. Our next question comes from Teresa. Hi, Teresa. Tell us what's uh, what your question is. Well, I've got ADHD and I'm managing it pretty darn good, I think, mostly. And now my mom is living with me. She's 96 and a half, and she has early dementia. I'll be doing something like trying to respond to an email or 
working on fixing my car window because I could do YouTube on that. But, you know, stuff like that. And she's always interrupting me because she is acting like she's a toddler. You know how kids, everything is big and important right mm -hmm. now. So it might be, usually it's pretty minor. Like uh, she wants me to help her with this. She uses an iPad with her email. You know, she forgets how to do things on it all the time. Or her phone is ringing and she can't find it or different things like that. And um, I feel like I can't stay on track and my ADHD is going bonkers. So I'm thinking she's like a toddler. Mm. You know, they always interrupt you for their hairdo or their, you know, their shoelace or whatever. But she's kind of like, how, how is her irritability? Is that a big issue? She is not. Okay. She is a pleasant and joyful person. Okay. I right. get crumpy. That's my problem. And I apologize okay. to her. And she goes, well, I just consider the source. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like there's still a, a really nice relationship there, though. Um, yeah. Ooh, okay. So how do you think she would respond if you set up something in your environment? that cues her to wait i was thinking of a Bre well, brendan i don't know if you still do this with your kids don't you have like a, like a three cup system or something if like <laughs> he still does and the cups are right there so why don't you uh explain because just a visual is not good for podcasting yeah no i'll walk you through it so the way that i use these for all kinds of stuff so i don't know how many options you want me to go through but the gist of it is there's a green cup a yellow cup and a red cup right so it's traffic lights. A green cup is, I use it for me getting interrupted. I think that's where we're heading. A green cup means, okay, guys, interrupt me, right? Like I'm, it's good. It's cool. A yellow cup is interrupt me, but only if it's important. And depending on how your mom is doing that may or may, that kind of judgment might be a little tricky. And then a red cup for my kids is someone better be bleeding, but it basically <laughs> means like, don't interrupt me, right? Like I can't be interrupted right now. You might want something a little more binary with your mom, depending, I don't know how, what level of like judgment right. she's able to bring to the table. So cups or even something as simple as a piece of paper where you can laminate two pieces of paper together. And if one piece of paper is green and the other side is red or pink or whatever color you need, so you can actually write on it and then just write, go ahead and talk to me and, and, or whatever, like I'm available. And then the other side could be, please don't interrupt. You could hang that on a door. You could hang that on a wall outside your office or wherever you're working. And that binary stuff might be a little better again, or you could use the cups if the judgment is there enough for yellow. I think that's a wonderful idea. The visual stuff is excellent. Another thing I did with my kids, this was more when I was teaching them. So, but the concept stays, I would wear a hat, right? Like we're in school mode. And if I took the hat off, we're not in school mode. I've had parents who I, our work from home. Right. And if they go to pee, the kid is like, but mom and mom's like, right. I can't talk to you. So I would have mom wear a hat. That was like the invisibility hat kind of like, you can't really see mom. She's not actually here. She just has to pee or needs a snack or something. And then she's going to go back and hide in her cave. Something along those lines might work too, a hat or a coat or something obvious. Yeah. I like that. And then that's me to remember using it. <laughs> Right. Do you think it would help to have like a um, like a small dry erase board that you can sort of refer her to? So if she has a question for you, she like instead of her having to hold on to what she wants to ask you, that she can actually write it down. Yeah, that's uh, well. She also always used to ask me, "What are we doing next Tuesday?" or "What's going on this week?" And I'm like, "I have to look right. it up." So I made a big giant calendar on the wall in the dining room. I post it for the next two weeks, and I update it all the time, so she can look and see what's happening, when, for who, and all that. But Helping her to maybe have some place to write stuff down is a good idea. I was thinking of, of Brandon's laminated paper. He, she could do as a dry erase on that even, on a laminated thing to, you know, write down her question. And when I'm done it, we erase it. Does she text? No, 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 no. That okay. just totally okay. confuses her. Um, do you remember um, from group the idea of leaving yourself a trail of crumbs? Yes, I love that. Have you been able to apply that? And just for everyone. So the idea is it makes it easier to come back to something that you're not able to finish by writing what you just did and then what you would do next if you were to keep working. It makes picking things back up way easier on the brain. Do you think that's something that you would be able to do like in that moment? Um, I've sort of been doing that 
like if she wants to know the address for her friend and it's in my phone, but it's on her iPad, but I'm, I'm using my phone to look up a thing that I was working on, then I'll just go to my contacts, do that. And but I'd say out loud to myself, I'm coming back to this next. And I think okay. that makes my brain keep it going. But one other idea, I don't know if you mm. were able to, but can you get like an in-home healthcare worker for a couple hours a day so that, you know, you at least have a couple hours where like, you're not going to be interrupted. That's the challenge where we, where I live in a remote area. The people I know are always already caring for others and there's not a lot available. Yeah, it's it's tough. Hang in there. All right. Let's, uh, I think we have time for um, maybe one or two more questions here. Speed around. We, we can try. I think we've tried this before with, with mixed results. Start reading some out. We can do that. This one's the very start from Jacqueline. How do you decide this is an ADHD thing and it should not be this much of a struggle so I should find a workaround versus this is hard, but everybody struggles to do it. So I will struggle to do it. Like, for example, training for a marathon. Also, there's a shout out in there for Moira. So, hi. Um, so, you know, this whole idea of uh, not everything is ADHD. When you have ADHD, yes, it is. Because like your your operating system is an ADHD operating system, right? So everything goes through that lens. So yeah, I, I think that we have to always look at everything we're trying to do in life through an ADHD lens. And what are the things that are going to accommodate that? Okay, done. Boyer, do you want to add to that or should we go to another question? Of course I do. Well, she wanted to answer. She I wanted guess. you. Okay. She wanted um, you. But why does it matter if it's an ADHD thing or not? Like, why do we have to do things the hard way? I think we get so used to things being hard that we're like, oh, well, it should be hard. And if it's not hard, it doesn't matter. Someone in my group referred to himself as a slacker. And I'm like, you are not a slacker. And so some of us feel that way, right? So if we think, well, but we do need to like earn some things. If we're good at it, it comes to us easy. That doesn't make us a slacker. And so I know this is going to make Brendan's wheels go and he's going to, and the other people, and they're going to be like, but I want to caveat that. So it's just, it doesn't have to be hard, but we do need resilience. I know that's one of Brendan's caveats. And now I just feel like I just spiral and forget the original question. So I'm just going to be quiet now. Thanks all. This is my caveat. The first time we do stuff, it's hard. Like that's the nature of being new at something is things are going to be hard. And nobody sucks at anything. They're just untrained. So if you're having trouble getting past that, I suck at it because I'm new, find someone who can help you and guide you and teach you and train you. And a while back on I went to Brene Brown's podcast, she used the uh, the first FFT, which stands for the first fucking time. We're supposed right. to suck at it the first fucking time, right? So, and even the second or third time, like allow yourself to incrementally get better at whatever it is you're doing. Next question. Here, I'll throw this one to Kat. What suggestions do you have for finding an ADHD friendly workplace? I think um, an ADHD friendly workplace, I, honestly, when I talk about like interviewing, when you, when you're, or, I'm sorry, when a company is interviewing you, you want to make sure that you are also interviewing the company. There are things like Glassdoor that will tell you a little bit about the organization, take all of that with a grain of salt. Uh, people in the industry usually don't like that. But ask other people that work there if you can. You can find people on LinkedIn. Um, but a lot of it has to do with the type of job it is. So looking at what the job responsibilities are, if those are things that you have a challenge with, if your ADHD manifests in a way that makes those job functions challenging for you, that may not be a good fit for you. That's not the company's fault. That's a, a reasonable expectation of the company. The other thing is to look and see a lot of companies are really embracing neurodiversity now. So check into that and find out if they are, what does that look like? Are those ERGs, which are employee resource groups? Are they training their management on that? Um, those types of things, but come to cash. We'll talk about it. This is a really good, uh, this is a really good topic and we can, I'd love to talk about that kind of stuff there. That's awesome. I know that uh, we, we've talked about this on the podcast. Um, so there, there's some episodes about that and where this discussion also uh, took place. All right. I'm looking at my time and, uh, you know, I might not like it, but I have to respect it. I know we have more questions. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Please come again next month. We do this every second Tuesday of the month. But before, before we head out for the day, Mr. Curb, give us a moment of that. And think ahead this time. Let's see. 
I was like, is this part of the punchline or yeah. did you actually No, forget? this is just me being slow this today. <laughs> what starts with tea, ends with tea, and is full of tea. A teapot. <laughs> Liked it. <laughs> Approved. All right. We got some groans and some eye rolls and uh, it was good. Thank you, Will. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Kat. Uh, we're so happy to have you. And uh, we will catch all of you back here next month. If you got your question answered and it was helpful for you and you uh, are able to consider becoming a patron, that helps us do a lot of the things that we are doing over here. You can become a patron by going to our website, ADHGWire.com, and just click on the Patreon tab at the top of the page. So we will catch all of you back here next month. Thank you, everybody. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons can join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keep Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang. The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Make It Stick. The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown. The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. 
And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.